Amen. All right, here this week we're in Matthew chapter number 2, continuing our Bible study. And last week in Matthew chapter number 1, just a really quick recap, most of the chapter had to do with Jesus' genealogy. Now, it's extremely important, and you're really going to, I believe, in chapter number 2, you're going to understand this even more so. It's very important that I continually pound into your minds the theme of the book of Matthew. You have all the Gospels, right? The four different Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and they all four have different themes. They present Jesus in different lights. Mark is that he's of no reputation. It's the, only, it's the only gospel of the four that does not mention any sort of genealogy or any type of origin in the sense of his fleshly birth or his deity and him being from everlasting, the fact that he is God. That is the book of Mark. It's, it, is the, it is the theme that he is of no reputation, right? He's, he's, you know, in that sense, he's a nobody to the world. Nobody knows who he is and he came to serve humbly and to be a servant. Uh, the book of Luke is, he is the son of man. The genealogy in Matthew goes back only to Abraham, but the genealogy in the book of Luke goes all the way back to Adam to emphasize his humanity, who is the, Adam that is the first man. It's where it has the longest record of actually his, his birth. It's really the only place where we actually have a record of where it talks about when he is born, and we're given a lot of information about that. That's only in Luke. Why? To highlight his humanity. Uh, uh, furthermore, it, it's the only place where you see him when he's 12 years old, right? It mentions him and he's, what is that doing? It's highlighting his humanity. Uh, there's, there's so many different things. It, it refers to him as the son of man in that gospel more than it does any of the other gospels. The book of John is all about him being God. You know, the very beginning of it, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He, he's always preaching and teaching that he is from above, right? You are from beneath, uh, speaking to mankind. You know, he says, before Abraham was, I am. If you believe not that I am he, you shall die in your sins. He's always making these statements, you know, that he's teaching and preaching that he is God. Now, Matthew is about him being the king of the Jews. It's about him being the Christ, the anointed, the Messiah, the king, he that is going to be the ruler, and specifically that he is the king of the Jews. When you look in Matthew chapter 1, you have the genealogy of Jesus going back to Abraham, who is the first Jew. Then, then there comes a time where it hits David. And from there on out, it's following the royal line. It's following the royal line until the Christ comes, who is born, who is the king of the Jews. Now, here in chapter number 2, it's, again, very, very heavy on Jesus being the king of the Jews. Speaking of him as a king and speaking of his descendants from the Jews and from Abraham. I want you to look with me here in chapter number 2, verse number 1. You're going to see it immediately. Now, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem. This is, of course, a very well-known story of the wise men that are coming uh, 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 to uh, uh, bring gifts unto Jesus. I want you to notice there it says, now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem, it says, of Judea. Or Judea people were pronounced that both ways. I want you to look down at verse number 5. We can figure out what this is referring to. It says, And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet. Now look at verse 6. And thou Bethlehem in the land of what? Judah. So it's just a little variation of spelling. It's just referring to the tribe of Judah, which became really a kingdom after the split. The kingdom of Judah. And of course, Jesus Christ came from Judah. That's where he was. He was of the tribe of Judah. Specifically, he was born in a city within the tribe, and that city was Bethlehem. Now, I want you to look with me at verse number two now, saying, where is he that is born? Look at this. King of the Jews. For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. So notice, right as soon as we get into chapter number 2, what is it highlighting? You have these men, these, men's, these men that are somewhat of royalty, and they're coming to Bethlehem in Judea, and they are asking, they're asking Herod, who's the king at that time, he's a tetrarch, he's a ruler of one of the four provinces over Rome. They're asking Herod, they're saying, where is he? And notice specifically what they call him. Where is he that is born King of the Jews. So right now there's a framework that is being laid strongly in chapter number 1 and chapter number 2 that wants you to look at Christ through the lens of being the King of the Jews. That particular genealogy is not mentioned in any of the other Gospels. I want you to think about this strongly. How it goes through from Abraham to David. It's not mentioned like that in any of the other Gospels. 
Not only that, the story that you are about to read is only in the book of Matthew. So you think of, I mean, it's the story of the wise men, right? Maybe if you aren't familiar with all four of the Gospels, you would assume, hey, that's a big story. That's a popular story. That's probably in each of the Gospels because there are a lot of stories that are in each of the Gospels. It's not. It's not in each of the Gospels, but it's specifically here because this is geared towards a certain audience and it's meant to convey a certain point and meant to, to show and present Jesus in a certain light. It is that he is the king of the Jews. You bring presents to kings, and that's what's taking place here. And they refer to him as the king of the Jews. They go on and say, For we have seen his star in the east, and are come, look at this, to worship him. Verse 3, When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled in all Jerusalem with him. Now, of course, Herod, we find out that he is troubled because he sees Jesus as a threat. I want you to look down. It tells you in verse number 7, Then Herod, when he had privily called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child. And when you have found him, bring me word again. Watch this, that I may come and worship him also. So they say, hey, we, we've come. We've seen his star in the, in the east. You know, he's the king of the Jews. You know, he, he, he's been born and we're coming to worship him. Well, of course, at this point we see that Herod now is, he's, he's responding to uh, uh, the wise men and he's saying, hey, I want you to go to Bethlehem. I'm going to send you to Bethlehem and I want you to inquire diligently until you find this young man, until you find this, this child. And then I want you to come back to me and tell me where he is so that I can go worship him. Now we find out over, and I want to go ahead and jump over to this and we'll, we'll just skim over it once we get to that point. I want you to jump over to verse number 16. It says, Then Herod, when he had saw that he was mocked of the wise men, because they did not return unto him as he had requested, it says he was exceeding wroth. Wroth is like his wrath, right? It's past, past tense. Extremely angry. And sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem, and in all the coast thereof from two years old and under. So he was not interested from the beginning in worshiping this child. He saw Jesus as a threat. So when we look at verse number 3, when it says, When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled. What it's referring to is the fact that he's worried. Because he's, he's seeing these men of royalty that are coming to him and saying, Hey, we're coming to worship the king of the Jews. Right? And he reigns very close to that province. And he's wondering, you know, who is this guy? I'm the king, right? That is going to be the reason why Herod is troubled. That's why he's worried at this point because he sees Jesus as being a threat. He goes on and says, and all Jerusalem with him. So Jerusalem is also worried and concerned. Look at verse 4. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. When we look in the Old Testament, the job, one of the jobs, of the many jobs, that is, of the, the scribes, the chief priests, the Levites in general was to understand and know the scriptures so that they could teach the scriptures. So he inquires of them that are supposed to know the Bible of where does the Bible say that, that uh, he's going to be born? Where is the Christ going to be born? Look at verse 5. It says, And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet. And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah. For out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. So also notice that here when this is a... I want you to notice that this is a prophecy about who? What did Herod say? Where is he that is born, you know, that is what? That is referred to as what? The Christ. When you go to this passage, what does the Christ do? He's a governor, right? That's a ruler. So what is the Christ going to be? A king. That's why when, when the three wise men come to him, or the wise men come to him, they say to him, hey, you know, where is the king? We're coming to worship the king of the Jews. And then Herod, when he leaves, he goes to the scribes and he goes to the chief priests and he says, hey, where is the Christ going to be born? Because what is the Christ? Remember, he is going to be a king. He is going to be a ruler. He's the king of the Jews. That's what the Christ is. Now, I want you to turn over to, keep your hand here, of course, because we'll be coming back. Go over to the Old Testament and the uh, Minor Prophets. We're going to go to Micah. Micah chapter number 5. It's after the book of Jonah. Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah. Micah chapter number 5. That's where this is quoted. 
Micah chapter number 5. Look with me. We'll look at verse 1 also because it is the same context. Now gather thyself in troops, O daughter of troops. He hath laid siege against, against us. They shall, watch this interesting, is the prophecy of Jesus. They shall smite the judge of Israel with a rod upon the cheek. Now that, of course, would be fulfilled later in his life. Notice he's the judge of Israel. Verse 2, But thou, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. Now, if you remember, we went through the book of Genesis. And the book of Genesis spoke about Ephrata. It was brought up a few different times. The city of Ephrata is the city of Bethlehem. They are one and the same. They are used interchangeably. And actually, one time in the, in the book of Genesis, I'm not going to turn back to it, it actually tells you Bethlehem, which is Ephrata, or maybe vice versa. But you can look that up. So Bethlehem is Ephrata. So don't be alarmed by that when you get here to uh, Matthew chapter number 2, and it quotes this, and it just says Bethlehem. That's because it's redundant in the first place when it's quoted in Micah. It's the exact same thing. It tells you that Bethlehem, which is Ephrata. So uh, here in Micah chapter number 5, verse number 2, so it's telling us where he's going to be. Another thing that we, we see that is uh, interchangeable here is ruler. It calls him a governor in Matthew, but it also calls him a ruler here in Micah chapter number 5. Verse number two is, governor is a ruler. What does a governor do? What does it mean to govern something? It means to rule. So these, these words are just interchangeable. You know, this is how the Bible you know, uh, uh, helps you to, to grow and to learn wisdom and to expand your vocabulary and your knowledge. Another thing that I've heard a lot of people, you know, uh, wonder about this verse, and I'll give you my quick interpretation of it. Um, man, what did I do with that bulletin? I don't know what I did with it. Um, anybody got a bulletin that I could get? You mind if I get that, Brother Eric? No, it's underneath the... Brother Hall said his hymnal down on top of it here. I'm good, thank you. Let me slide this in here. Um, one of the things that people will ask about in Micah chapter number 5, verse number 2, when they compare with Matthew, um, there seems to be something that's a little slightly different. And you find this in a lot of the quotations. There's, there's little differences. Just like how we saw ruler, governor, and then we saw how Ephrata was in the Old Testament. It's not in the New Testament. So people will look at these kind of different wordings. And sometimes, you know, people, it will bother people sometimes. But really what we can do with this is we can compare the two and we learn. We grow and we can learn by comparing the two. I want you to notice here in Micah chapter number 5, verse number 2. One more time, let's read it, and I'm actually going to expound it a little bit. It says, But thou, Bethlehem Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel. So in that passage, it seems to be saying that even though you're smaller, you're smaller, Bethlehem was not like this, you know, this, it wasn't Jerusalem. It wasn't, you know, it's called the city of David, but, you know, it's only well known because that's where David was born and that's where the Messiah would be born. But otherwise, there were no significant events that took place there. It was not a, a point of power at all, geographically. So people would think, well, that's not really, you know, that, that big of a city. It's saying, but even though, in spite of all that, that is where the Messiah is going to be born. God declares that that is where I'm going to bring forth the Messiah or the Christ. That's where he's going to be born. If you look at Matthew chapter number 2, it's a little bit different wording. And I think you can learn something from this. It tells you in, in verse number 5, it says, And they said unto him in Bethlehem of Judea, For thus it is written by the prophet. Now we, we can see what prophet that is. That's the book of Micah. And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah. So what does it mean when he says you're not the least among the princes of Judah? I believe that it's talking about the significance. Because when you look at the passage and how it's quoted in Micah chapter number 5, he's saying, hey, you know, though you are smaller, right? But here when it says you're not the smallest, I don't think it's talking about size. I think it's talking about significance. And I'll show you why. Look at what it says next. For, what does for mean? Because. So why, why do they have significance? In spite of them being small and being one of the smallest, why do they have significance? For out of thee shall come a governor. So see how you can learn things, and it's very interesting, by looking at it when it's quoted in the Old Testament, and you can understand, hey, he's speaking about its size. He's talking about the size, and he's speaking about its, its influence. But then once you get to the New Testament, it's quoted just a slightly different way, right? And you can learn from that. He says, for out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. So it's real important. Look up the scriptures when they're quoted. You can always learn from it. Look at verse number 7. Then Herod, when he had privily, that's like, you know, secretly or privately, 
called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. So he's asked them how long ago did this take place when you first saw the star. That's going to tell you when he was born. Verse 8, And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child, and when you have found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. Of course, he's dealing subtly. When they had heard the king, they departed, and lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. So obviously this star is divinely guiding them to the location of, of uh, the young child who is the Messiah. Look at where it's, what it says next in verse 10. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. So when they saw that they had you know, seen the star, it had appeared unto them again, it had led them to the location, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. Now look at verse 11. And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. Now I want to deal with just a couple of things real quick of misconceptions that, and how people will misconstrue a few things. When you're reading this story, the first thing that comes to everybody's mind is the nativity scene. That's what everybody thinks about when you think about the, you know, the wise men, when you think about you know, Jesus' birth and all these different things. But real quickly, let me explain to you a few errors in the nativity scene. Number one is when you look at Luke chapter number two, which records the birth of Jesus, the famous record of when Jesus is actually born, that is where we see the shepherds. And right at the birth, the shepherds are singing. They see the angels, right? Or the angels are singing. The shepherds see the angels. And then the shepherds immediately, and it, and it actually says that they go down and they see the babe. So what does babe mean? It means he's a baby, right? So the shepherds at the birth, they go down there and they see him and he's a baby. So he's referred to as a babe. Now, people, what they will do is they will conflate these two stories and they'll run these two stories together as though they are happening at the same time. When you look at a nativity scene, you have baby Jesus there and he's in the manger and then you have Mary and you have Joseph also there. You have the shepherds there, which all of that is pretty much correct right there. Of, 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 that's depicting, that right there is correct, depicting from Luke chapter number 2. But another thing that they do is they put the wise men there. And that is an error. Now I want you to look here at verse number 11 and point something out to you. It says, And when they were coming to the house, watch this, they saw the young child with Mary his mother and fell down and worshipped him. I want you to notice he's not, he's specifically not called a babe here. What is he referred to as? A young child. Now, even Herod himself at the end of verse 9 said where the young child was. He's referred to as a young child. He asked them, uh, Herod inquires of the wise men of when the star appeared, right? He gives them the amount of time. Well, that time is actually what he bases the number or the range of the children that he's going to kill on. Do you know why? Because he knew that when that star appeared is when that child was born. Now, how long do you think that it took these men to travel from the east to get all the way to... Mary and to Jesus, who is the king of the Jews. Do you think it happened in a day? Of course not. You know, they weren't flying on a plane, right? It wasn't immediate. They weren't there with the shepherds. So the nativity scene is a hoax. I'm sorry to break it to you. You know, there's errors with it, right? So they showed up when he was a young child. He's not referred to as a babe. He's referred to as a young child. So the next misconception... And, th and this necessarily isn't a misconception, to be honest. It makes sense, but it is conjecture. It, although it makes sense, it is someone that is kind of interpreting things, is that there were three wise men. There is never a number that is given you, given you of how many wise men were there. Where that comes from is verse number 11. It says when they came in, it says, And when they had opened their treasures, there, you know, they is used here, for antecedents here, or for pronouns, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, so we know that it's plural, of course. It says, they presented unto him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. Now where that comes from, that there's three of them, is the fact that there's three gifts. Now is that a pretty safe assumption? I would say yes. You know, I don't think that, you know, two guys came and one guy brought two gifts, one guy brought one, and then the other guy is just like, hey, I'm here. 
You know, I would say that each person probably brought a gift. That's, that, I think that that's a pretty safe assumption. There probably was three. If I had to guess, I think it makes sense to say there was three. But that is, the, that is not explicitly taught in Scripture. So you shouldn't say things. You could explain to somebody, hey, it makes sense. There probably was three. We don't know that for sure. But it could have been two guys. It maybe could have been two. One of them could have brought two gifts. You know, maybe he's a little more wealthy than the other wise man. And then the other guy just brought one gift. That's also a possibility. We know that there was, you know, more than one, of course. So that is uh, uh, something that people will just, you know, take for granted and will teach as though it is scripture, but we don't know that for certain. The other thing is, and this I believe also has some backing. I believe it makes, you know, very well sense. And that is that they were kings. Like we hear this, we sing the song. We three kings of Orient. Orient's like, you know, uh, Asia, Oriental, right? We three kings of Orient are. And they're referred to as kings. Now, they are never specifically called a king in the Bible. They're never called a king. They are called wise men. But let me say this also to that. That, that also makes sense. To, you know, we use the word king very specific today. But the word king or governor or ruler or prince, if you know your Bible, you'll know that those words are very well used interchangeable. And when you look up wise men in the Bible, one of the places where you find wise men is they are, they are oftentimes these, these, uh, uh, these men of higher class that are going to Pharaoh and they are going to Nebuchadnezzar. These are men of royalty and they are men of power. And one of the reasons why they end up hating Daniel is because because he's basically kind of, he's getting the advantage on them. They're, they are men of rulership. They are men of power to some degree. So it makes sense that you would refer to them, you know, in a way and loosely as some sort of a ruler. But either way, they had some sort, in some way, authority. And I believe one of the things that we can take away from that in understanding, hey, wise men were men that had power. Wise men were men that had authority. You know, they may not have been called kings, they may not have been specifically called princes. You know, they may have just been referred to as wise men. We can learn something from that of these men that were of higher class. These men were that were of a, repu a high reputation and were looked up to. I want you to notice that even they came to the birth of Christ. And what did they do? They brought gifts and they brought presents. So in a sense, you have these men that maybe were some sort of a king. There maybe were some sort of royalty. Maybe some sort of, you know, a, a governor, a wise man, men that were looked up to in the, their uh, society. And when Jesus was born, they dropped what they were doing. And like I said, these men of upper class, these men of authority, they came and they worshipped Jesus. And this is just, what this is, is this is uh, uh, basically a forerunner of the picture of Jesus being the king of kings. So you have men that are coming to him that are of, you know, a, a high class, that are of authority. And what are they doing? They're ba bowing down to Jesus as a baby. Wouldn't that be humbling? You know, to see this baby lying there and coming before this baby and kneeling down before this baby and presenting gifts unto. And as I said, I'm, you know, the nativity scene has just corrupted my mind, right? He's a young child. He's not a baby, right? But they're going to this young child and they're bowing down before this young child. Can you imagine that? A one and a half, two year old child bowing down before this child and worshiping this child and giving gifts unto this child. Wouldn't that be humbling? And you yourself being in some class royalty. What it shows is that Jesus, there's no exceptions. There's no one that is excluded from this that Jesus is the king of all kings. And that's what you're being taught is notice, like I said, that this story is only taught in Matthew chapter number two. And notice what they say when they're coming. They say, hey, where is he that is born? King of the Jews. We're coming to worship him. What do they want you to understand and know? That, hey, he is, he is of royalty. He is the king of the Jews. He is the king of kings. So when we see these men of importance, they come and they bow down to Jesus. And all kings and, and everyone that has ever lived, no matter what social standing they have, will one day bow down before Jesus. Look with me now at uh, verse number 12. It says, And being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. So God came to them and warned them in a dream as well. So they didn't go back to Herod and tell him where he was. They, just, they went a different way back to their own country. Verse 13, And when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeareth to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, and take 
the young child and his mother and flee into Egypt and be thou there until I bring thee word. For Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. Notice how he's referred to as a young child over and over and over again. Now I'll give you the age of about how old that I think he is. I think he's like I mentioned just a moment ago. He's probably about a year and nine months old. And the reason why I say that is because when Herod goes out to kill all of them, to, kill all, to try to kill Jesus and kill all of the children of the Jews, he chooses based on the number, uh, the, the, the amount of time when he inquired for the star, he chooses two years, two years and younger. So how old, he, how old do we know that he, you know, what's the oldest that we know that he could be? Two years. He can't be any older than two years old. That's what we know for a fact, right? So he's not a baby in a, you know, a manger when they arrive. He's in a house also. I didn't point that out, but it says, and when they were coming to the house, Jesus was not born in a house, he was born in an inn. So he, this is not the same story. You can prove that he was not, that the wise men did not come when the shepherds were there. So this is an error that people will commonly, you know, repeat. Um, so he is a young child, but he, we know that uh, even still being a young child, he's not any older than two years old. So you can learn a lot from just kind of studying this out. He's called a young child repeatedly. They flee into Egypt because Joseph is now being warned. So after the wise men, Joseph receives a dream, as we read there in verse 13. And he's warned to take the young child, it says, and his mother, and flee into Egypt, and be thou there until I bring thee word. So he's saying, go there and stay there until I bring you word. Right? And he says, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. So Herod is wanting to kill Jesus and he's being warned about that. Now one of the things, we'll read verse 14 and then I'll hit on this. When, when he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed into Egypt. So he went into Egypt. One of the things that black Hebrew Israelites will, will uh, uh, teach and people that, I've even heard people say this, you know, my, my uh, and your guys' ex-pastor taught this one time that Jesus was probably black because he went into Egypt. And the reason why they would say that he went into Egypt was because he's darker skinned and we look at people that are born in Egypt, they're darker skinned. And they'll say, where is Egypt located? What continent is it located? Africa. It's up in like the northern, you know, it'd be like the northeast part of Africa, the tip north of, of Africa. And then the Red Sea is what actually separates the continent going into Asia. And then Israel's just on the other side. But Two problems with that. Number one, Egyptians are not black like how the majority, as far as their skin color. Throughout history, they weren't either. Black, as black as, you know, what you would say uh, an African, you know, from Botswana, Malawi, you know, Somalia, areas like that. Niger, you know, you know there's, a, there's a vast difference in those that, lived in e that live in Egypt today and those below. Because they're so close right there. Two, and there's a gradual change in their skin color. They're not near as dark. One of the ways that you can show that is that they're actually, there is a, a, a hieroglyphics, that, you know how they, they would have all of these preserved hieroglyphics. And they have a lot of their hieroglyphics that they have on, on, on uh, you know, different archaeology of, of vessels and things they've dug up in rooms and stuff that they'll go into in existing structures. They have the Egyptians drawn and you can contrast them sometimes with servants that they had that were African. And they're not the same color. The Africans are much darker and the Egyptians are much lighter skinned. Just like we see today. But furthermore, even besides that, Jesus was not going into Egypt so that he could blend in. Like so he looked like everybody else. Like Jesus is getting an alias and he's changing his name. Like Joseph is like, hey, I'm Jose. You know, you're, you are Jesus. When we go. That's ridiculous. They're not going there to hide out in that sense. It's on the other part of the sea. That's why they're going. And it's outside of Herod's jurisdiction. It's simple. It's very easy to understand when you look at it. They're not going. It's not like Herod sent people to Egypt to find him. And they're like going in there, you know, on an espionage trip to try to locate Jesus and Joseph and Mary. They're just leaving the jurisdiction because, and you know why? Use your brain for a minute. God knows all things. God knew that what was going to take place. Specifically in Bethlehem, in the Jerusalem area, Judah area, what was going to happen? Those that were there in that jurisdiction where he had rule were all going to die two years and under, under. So he's just making sure that he gets out of there, out of his jurisdiction, out of where he is governing. 
It's not like you can blend in, like he just gets there and he's, you know, Jesus is like this cold, dark, black guy that's walking around with a bunch of black people. Egypt's not like that anyways. That's, that's garbage. It's not true. You know, it's not like it matters what color that Jesus is, but it does matter when people try to twist what color Jesus was and what color the Israelites were because they're racist and they, you know, have some sort of, you know, supremacy type of teaching, right? You know, I could care less personally what color Jesus was. If Jesus was as black as coal, I would love Jesus and serve Jesus and bow to Jesus just as much as I would if he was an albino. That doesn't matter to me slightly. I don't care about that at all. Whether, yeah, Jesus has to look like me. What kind of prideful jerk do you think that I am? It's ridiculous. I don't care what color Jesus is. I don't care where Jesus is from. You know, I love Jesus because he first loved me and he died on the cross for me and he created me. That's why I love Jesus. It's not like, you know, I love Jesus because he's white. You are out of your stinking mind. But you know what? There are a lot of people out there that are like that, that are racist, and they just look at, they try to make Jesus out to be like themselves because they're a prideful jerk. That's what it is. It's pride is why they do that. You know, and that's how the black Hebrew Israelites are. And you can tell that, they, you know what they say? This is called projection. There's a certain comment on that one video that I made that's got like 50,000 views. Over and over and over again, there's like a, a common thread. And they've commented on there over and over again, and they always say this. You, you would hate the idea if Jesus was black. You, you know that you wouldn't serve Jesus and worship Jesus if Jesus was black. Do you know why they're saying that? Because if Jesus was white, they wouldn't worship him. That's called projection. Because that's how they feel. They're like, well, that's how you feel. No, that's not true. I would worship Jesus if he was red, blue, purple, green. That's not why I love Jesus. That's not why I serve Jesus. That's not why... I like the Bible and love the Bible. That, I'm not, you know, you know I, don't, I'm, I don't make this a big deal and preach against the black Hebrew Israelites, you know, maybe more so than I should, because I'm a racist and I want Jesus to be white. It's because I'm fighting against racism. I don't care what color Jesus is. It's not like two people like, oh, he wants Jesus to be white and they want Jesus to be black. No, I don't care what color Jesus is. And I'm pointing out the fact that the Bible does teach that Jesus is white only because they want Jesus to be black and they're trying to twist scripture so they can make him black. But I'm going to preach whatever the Bible teaches. And it's in there for a reason, so I'm going to preach it. You know, and, and, and hope, you know, it's, it's not hopefully, but it's possibly, that's what I meant to say, possibly it's in there just for people like them. You know, because God knew that this movement would come along or maybe there was bigger movements like this in the past. But it's in there for a reason. Whether we know exactly what it was or not. Another thing that I want to point out in verse number 13, it tells you, Arise, look at this, and take the young child and his mother. Look at the same thing in verse 14. When he arose, he took the young child and his mother. So notice when the angel of the Lord comes and then when the Holy Spirit records it, he makes a very specific statement. He says, take the young child and his mother. What does that denote? What's, what's odd about that wording? It's not Joseph's child, is it? It's not. He didn't say, hey, take your child and his mother or your wife. He didn't say that, did he? The focus is on the fact that and the Holy Spirit's bringing the attention to the fact that it is not his son. Whose son is it? It's God's son, right? If Jesus Christ was just a man, if Jesus Christ was just a man, then we're all damned because man will never be able to save you. There's none good, no, not one. And if Jesus Christ's father was Joseph, we're all damned because then he's just a man. He's got his father's side of just humanity. He would have his mother's side of what? Mary, and that would be humanity. If that were the case, then we would all be damned. None of us would be going to heaven. Because he could have never lived a righteous life. He, could have you know, he wouldn't have had power in his blood. He had to offer himself through the eternal spirit. But notice the Bible's very, very clear here to specify. That's, this is the perfection. This is how fine-tuned that every word is preserved, every you know, jot and tittle from the beginning to the end. And the Bible's very careful. But you know the new versions aren't like that. The new versions are a few different places, and especially in the book of Luke, and I believe Luke chapter number 3, it says very clearly, it says that jo it says his father and his mother, instead of saying Joseph and his mother. It actually calls Joseph Jesus' father. And when you point that out to people sometimes that are maybe learned or academia, you know, these types of people, they would say, oh, it's not that big of a deal. I mean, he was his father in the sense that he is the one that performed the ceremonies. He raised him. No, it's a very, very, very stinking big deal. And that's why repeatedly the Bible's very careful to make sure that they never refer to 
Joseph as Jesus' father. Never. It never happens. There's not a single time, but the new versions do that. That shows how finely tuned the Bible is, and they just get in here and they're like, well, we could just, you know, just kind of update it, just retranslate a couple of things. And you get man in there, and God's not involved, and he's not preserving his own word, you're going to have error immediately. You think, oh, it's just, we could do a good job. You know, we're just going to, you know, change a couple of things, just switch a couple of words out here, do this, do that. It'll all be good and we're done. They put out their Bible, error, error, error. You flip, you know, two, three pages. This contradicts here. This quote isn't exactly here. You know, all kinds of mistakes, all kinds of problems, all kinds of errors. You won't find that in the King James Bible. You'll find the Holy Spirit being very careful. Very careful to say, hey, take the young child and his mother. Because you're not his father, Joseph. That's why. And it says it repeatedly in this chapter. Look at verse number 15. And was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt have I called my son. So let's look this passage up real quick too. This is also in the Old Testament, Hosea, the minor prophets. Hosea chapter number 11. Hosea chapter number 11. This is immediately after Daniel. Hosea chapter number 11. It's technically the first book in the... the uh, Minor prophets. Hosea chapter number 11, verse number 1. It says, When Israel was a child, then I loved him and called my son out of Egypt. Now, notice this is talking about, you know, uh, in two senses, there's two applications. The surface meaning is at the time speaking about how God led Israel, the nation, out of Egypt. He called them out of Egypt, brought them out of Egypt, and he planted them in the land of Canaan, which became. The land of Israel. And we look this up here, uh, this, this, this passage where it's quoted, we can see that there's obviously a second application when it's quoted here in chapter number 2. And this occurs very, very often. Very, very often when something is being quoted, it's being used as a secondary application. So that's one thing that we can learn from this when we read that in context. The other thing is this. You know, uh, the promise of, of uh, you know, the... the and it really technically is the gospel, but the promise that was given to Abraham was given to Abraham and his seed. And, that pro and his seed was Christ. And that's what you can see there when it's speaking of Israel, it's speaking about the promise that is given to Christ ultimately. So there's, there's still a truth to be learned. I don't want to delve too deep into that because it's kind of off topic, but there's still a truth to be learned there that that seed, which is Israel, Jesus is the fulfillment of Israel. That's why when we're in Christ, what are we now? We're Israel. That's because he is Abraham's son. Abraham's child that that promise was given to is singular. It's not everyone up until, up until Jesus that was born or everyone that came from Abraham. That's not true. It's Abraham and his seed who is Jesus who is actually Israel, the nation of God, everyone that's in him. And that's another truth to be learned from that. Um, so... Look back with me at Matthew chapter number 2, verse 16. Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, because they didn't return, uh, he, he felt like a fool, is what it's saying, was exceeding wroth, and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem, and in all the coasts thereof, from two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. Now, I want to flip over, and it's... I didn't write this down and didn't necessarily expect to turn here. I kind of thought about it. But I, I want you to go with me to the book of Revelation. And uh, there's really you know, uh, a few applications that are taught here in a, a chapter that we had turned to a few times. So I think it's, it's good to turn there. So look at Revelation chapter number 12. Revelation chapter number 12. We're going to see the great red dragon that we had been studying about uh, in the End Times Bible Prophecy series. Look at chapter number 12, verse number 1. It says, And there appeared a great wonder in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet. And upon her, head was, uh, upon her head a crown of twelve stars. Now those twelve stars represent the twelve princes of Israel. And this woman represents what you would say is Rachel. You could even say Mary, bringing forth a son. Verse 2, And she, she being with child cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold a great red dragon. Now that's Satan having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads, and his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And then it says this, And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered 
for to devour her child as soon as it was born. And then we're told who this child is. Look at verse 5. And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. So who is this child that is born that's going to rule? This is Jesus Christ. This is the ruler that was going to come forth from Bethlehem that we saw. It's the Messiah. So who, who would the, the woman represent? Well, the woman represents Israel, of course. It's also, you could say, immediate application is that the woman represents Mary. Because we see that, that immediately when the child is born, what, is, what does the great red dragon try to do? Tries to destroy the child as soon as what? As soon as he's born. What do we see take place in Matthew chapter number 2 as soon as Jesus is born? We see Herod trying to destroy or trying to kill who? Jesus. As soon as he's born, as soon as he finds out about it, he tries to kill him. So it just shows the depths of the Bible. When you read in Revelation 12, the immediate application may be geared towards end times Bible prophecy, but there's so many layers that you can learn from. So that's definitely pointing towards um, the massacre that took place with Herod here. Uh, and also another thing you can learn is, when, so when Herod was doing this, Whose work was Herod peddling? Who was, he, who was really behind the scenes in this? Herod had his own agenda, but it shows you that, the, that Satan, that the great red dragon was behind the scenes. And, you know, like the Bible tells us in the book of Ephesians, you know, that there's spiritual wickedness in high places. And that, is, that was true uh, when it goes all the way back to the time of Herod, goes all the way back to the beginning of, you know, uh, of the earth. In high places, there are, there are rulers of the darkness of this world. People that are in power are evil people. And it's almost all the time. There are rare exceptions, but almost all the time, the people that are in power, the governments, the governors, are very wicked, evil people. And they have their own agenda. They would have their own reason why they want to kill Jesus or why they want to do whatever wickedness you know, that they, that they you know, uh, pass decrees for. But really, you know who's behind, behind the scenes? The great red dragons who's behind the scenes. You know really who's, who's wanting this, these, this wickedness you know, to, to go forth and to become prevalent? It's really Satan behind the scenes. Look at what it says in verse number 17. Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremy, the prophet, saying... So Jeremy is Jeremiah. It's just another variation of the same name. That's Jeremy, the prophet, saying, In Ramah was there a voice heard, lamentation and weeping... And great mourning. Rachel weeping for her children and would not be comforted because they are not. Now, Rama or Rama, you can call it. I've heard it called, you know, referred or, or pronounced as both. That is in the land of Ephraim, if you look that up. So that's in the land of Ephraim, but it's referring to generally just Israel and Jerusalem. And when it says Rachel, this is actually quoted, we're not going to go there for this one, but it's Jeremiah 31, 15. When there was, at that time, many people dying, uh, they, were, they were starving, it was the Babylonian captivity, and when Babylon came in, burned the city, killed many people, you know, they slew many people, there were many children that died, and Rachel, that is referring to the mothers of Israel, because Rachel is the mother at the very top of all of the children of Israel, you know, she is considered, you know, uh, uh, the, the wife that Israel, or who is Jacob, who he, or whom he loved the most. So when it's saying Rachel weeping for her children, that's all the mothers of Israel weeping for their children because they just lost their babies through this decree that Herod, you know, uh, this executive order, if you will. We've seen a lot of those lately, these executive orders, right? Rachel weeping for her children would not be comforted, it says, because they are not. Now, in the Bible, that means that they're dead when it says that, he, he is not. It's saying he doesn't. He's, he's not here any longer. He doesn't exist in this world any longer. He's gone. It says because they are not. That means they are dead. Look at verse 19. But when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeareth in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Arise, and take the young child and his mother, and go into the land of Israel, for they are dead, which sought the young child's life. So he comes to him and tells him, and I want you to notice he's still a young child. So, you know, I don't know how long he spent there. Obviously, we know for a fact that he wasn't there any longer than, you know, when he was 12. I would say that he probably wasn't there very long. I'd say maybe there for a few months, maybe a year or something along those lines. He's still referred to by the same title. He says, the young child, he says, take the young child and his mother and go into the land of Israel. So he's supposed to go back to Israel. For they are dead which sought the young child's life. So Herod was dead at this time. Look at verse 21. 
And he arose and took the young child and his mother and came into the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus did reign in Judea, remember that's Judah, in the room of his father Herod. Room just means stay or place. So in the place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go thither, notwithstanding being warned of God in a dream, he turned aside into the parts of of Galilee. So where he ended up going, which would be considered still Israel, he went to specifically Galilee. Now Galilee is that of the Gentiles, we're told, throughout the New Testament. Many Gentiles lived throughout this area. It tells you in verse number 23, And he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophets, he shall be called a Nazarene. Now, so we see here that, you know, they return back you know, they start to go back to Israel in general, and then J Joseph hears that Archelaus is ruling. So it's, it, this is not another dream that comes to him. Joseph just hears about that, right? He hears that Archelaus, who is Herod's son, is reigning in Herod's place. It says the room of his father. So then at that moment, he decides, hey, I'm not going to go exactly where Archelaus is, but notwithstanding, so even still, he still goes to basically where Herod is. He goes into Galilee, and he settles in Galilee. And like I said, Galilee is where the Gentiles live. Many of the Gentiles and also those of Israel in that location were mixed in and mingled to where they weren't even considered, you know, those of Israel. And because of that, he's called, it says, a Nazarene. Now, the first thing I want to deal with, a couple of things here, but the very first thing that I want to deal with is, uh, Brother Hall had brought this up to me the other night, and in verse number 23 here, it tells you, it says, and he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, right? That it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophets. So this is a prophecy, right? He shall be called a Nazarene. Now, I had noticed this as well, and Brother Hall had brought it up, that he tried to search for. What were you doing? You're reading through the book of Matthew and you wanted to find all of them. Is that what I overheard? He's just wanting to look up all the prophecies and know the location of them. And I do that often. You know, I have a little, I have a wide margin Bible and I'll write down the reference of where they are quoting from. And I had done this at one point too, tried to look this up and I had noticed that I, it was nowhere to be found. Like I couldn't find this quote anywhere in the Old Testament. And I just kept looking and kept looking. I looked stuff up on the internet after that as well. I've never found anyone that's ever said and I've never noticed anything when reading through the Old Testament. I've never noticed this particular quotation in the Old Testament. And I don't personally believe, I think that I've looked, you know, I inquired diligently. I think I, I've looked thoroughly enough that I don't think that it's there. Now, you know, one possibility, if it is there, and I've thought about this as well, Brother Rick brought this up, that maybe, maybe that Nazareth is referred by another name. But maybe that's, po that's possible. Maybe Nazareth is maybe called by, like how Bethlehem is Ephrata, right? Just like that. And it's actually just called Ephrata. That's a possibility. But I personally, from my studies, I don't think that it's in the Old Testament. So people would say like, well, well you know, isn't, this, you know, isn't there something wrong here? You know, isn't this a mistake? No, it's not. And I'll tell you why. Because there are two ways that the Bible refers to prophecies. When it's getting ready to tell you that there is a prophecy. Right? And it will say, thus was fulfilled by the prophet... Or, and it will tell you when it, when it speaks such a way, it will say, you know, like we see here, it will say, also it will say sometimes that it might be fulfilled, and it will tell you either one of two things, which was written by the prophet, or which was spoken by the prophet. Now, the most common of the two is written. Now, what do we know? What does written mean? It means it was penned down, right? That means we know for a fact that it was written down. This is the only prophecy period that I've ever seen, and I'm pretty sure that I've looked at all of them, that's in the, the New Testament that you can't find in the Old Testament. It's the only one. The vast majority of the prophecies, when they are quoted, it will tell you, thus was, you know, uh, fulfilled, which was spoken, I'm sorry, which was written, is what it will say. The vast majority of the prophecies in the New Testament will say, thus was fulfilled, which was written by the prophet. And you can look it up and find it, and it's in the Old Testament. But I want you to notice what this says. It says, thus, I'm sorry, that it might be fulfilled, watch this, which was spoken by the prophets. Now, does that tell you 100% that you're going to find that in the Old Testament? It doesn't, right? Because it says that it was spoken. It doesn't say that it was written. 
now there are times when it says that it was spoken right there's even times I believe there's one in this chapter that it says it was spoken and you can find it written but let me ask you this question be just because it says that it was spoken does that mean that it wasn't written no right so there could be a time where it says that it was spoken and it was written but let me also ask you this just because it says that it was spoken you know does that mean that we're for sure gonna find it in the Old Testament where it's written no of course not right no so it could be spoken and not written that's a possibility but obviously if it tells you up front hey it's written then we're going to be able to look it up and we're going to be able to locate this and find it somewhere in the Old Testament. So I believe that the Bible is very careful here as well, just like it's careful when it says, you know, because there's these two variations that it uses. There's two ways that it tells you, hey, this is a prophecy. Here, it's very careful to tell you that it was spoken. And another thing that you may not have noticed before, it says spoken by the prophets, plural. It doesn't say prophet, it says it was spoken by the prophets. And I'll tell you a possibility is that because this wasn't pinned down, maybe throughout many generations, God was just having this handed down orally. Maybe it was just, it was just orally passed down and he kept you know, giving this to the different prophets and they were just preaching this over and over and over again. And so at least I know for a fact and we can see for a fact that more than one prophet preached this. So that's not a contradiction because it doesn't say written. And people try to point to that, but the Bible just goes right over their head, right? The other thing is that people say, hey, you know, uh, uh, you know, when you see pictures of Jesus, you know, he looks like he is, you know, he's, he looks like he's a white European, right? Jesus was not a white European. Jesus did not have blonde hair and blue eyes. Solomon, it talks about, was white. He was white and ruddy, but it says that he had bushy hair. He had black hair. It talks about that. So, he, he, Jesus probably looked more so like someone from, you know, Turkey or from Syria. That's more so what Jesus probably looked like. He probably had, you know, much darker hair, probably had darker skin, but he was still light enough to be referred to as being white because the Israelites are called white multiple times in the Bible. But one thing that I can guarantee you, and I'm not going to turn there, is that Jesus did not have long hair. That's another error in this picture. They have this white European guy who has this, just this flowing long brown hair. And he has blue eyes and his hair is always coming out in the front. And it's kind of like parted in the back. Looks super feminine, super girly. The Bible tells you in 1 Corinthians chapter number 11 that it is a shame for a man to have long hair. Jesus was not ashamed unto God. Jesus was sinless. He was perfect. He never sinned. And it says that it's a dishonor if you have long hair. That it's, that it's not honorable for a man to have long hair. So I can guarantee you that Jesus did not have long hair. It even tells you in that passage. Not only does it tell you that it's a shame for a man to have long hair. It says that a man should not have long hair because that you would be shaming God and Jesus is the image of God. So you expect me to believe that we're not supposed to have long hair because we would shame God. We would shame Jesus, let's say. But then Jesus is over here with long hair. Like, hey, bro, but you can't have long hair because you bring it, be a shame unto me. We would shame him by doing something he's already doing? That's stupid. It doesn't make sense. Jesus didn't have long hair. Jesus had short hair like a man. And it says that women are supposed to have long hair and that it's given her for a covering. It says that, that having long hair is a glory to women. Women are supposed to have long hair. It's pretty when women have long hair, right? You know, men are meant to have short hair. Women, long hair. This is to further the already strong distinctions that are found in, inherently in nature in men and women. We're not the same. Having long hair is feminine looking, isn't it? That's why men look like girls when they have long hair. It's girly. when a, It just looks girly. Naturally, it just looks feminine, right? It's a feminine feature. That's why God wants to strengthen the femininity of females by saying, hey, I have long hair. Men, you should have short hair. Right? So Jesus did not have long hair. The where people get this is the fact that they say, well, Jesus was, like it says here, he was a Nazarene. And we know that the, that the Nazarene vow, right? The Nazarene vow says that you can never cut your hair. Now, number one, there is no such thing as the Nazarene vow. It's called the Nazarite vow. Jesus was not a Nazarite. Jesus was a Nazarene, okay? 
Nazareth was a city in Israel. It was a city, and people that lived in that city were called Nazarenes. Then there was a vow that's called the Nazarite vow, and those people are called Nazarites. You could be of any city, of any tribe in Israel, and take the Nazarite vow. You could be of Bethlehem. You could be of Zebulun. You could be of Nephali and take the Nazarite vow and be a Nazarite. But that is not the same as being a Nazarene who is someone that lives in Nazareth. Furthermore, the Nazarite vow did not teach that you could not cut your hair. You know, like there's pictures of Samson, you know, with, him, with also him having this super long hair. And I even saw this, 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 like, uh, 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 hit the, the Bible series on the History Channel where they had Samson as being like this African guy with dreads. And his hair is like super stinking long. The Nazarite vow did not say that you could not cut your hair. The Nazarite vow says that you cannot have a razor come upon your head. It says that you cannot be shaven. It never says that you cannot cut your hair. It says that you cannot have a razor come upon your head. You cannot be shaven. And those are the exact things, both of them, that Samson tells uh, 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 Delilah. He says, he says he'll lose all of his strength. He says that uh, uh, if he be shaven. He said, if I be shaven, I'll become weak and be as a, uh, any other man. He says, since I was a, a, a child, uh, I've never had a razor come upon my head. And oh, another way to prove that in order to be in compliance to the Nazarite vow, you don't have to have long hair, is the fact that when did Samson gain his, his strength back? It says, albeit his hair began to grow. What does that imply? That he has long hair? I'm saying he has any hair at all. Now he's in compliance with the Nazarite vow. When a person is shaven with a razor, do they have any hair? No. You understand? So, they got two errors here. Jesus was not a Nazarite. You can prove Jesus did not take the Nazarite vow because there are certain stipulations. You know what Jesus did? He touched dead bodies because he touched them and healed them. As a Nazarite, you cannot touch any dead bodies. And there's certain things, dietary restrictions, other things that you can prove that Jesus is not a Nazarite. Jesus did not take the Nazarite vow. Jesus was a Nazarene because he was from Nazareth. Now, one of the things I'd like to just real quick give you a super quick application that we can learn from this is when you look up where Jesus went and lived, it was not the greatest area. It was not the greatest part of town. Where Jesus went and lived, number one, was, yeah, they were descendants of Israel, but they were massively mixed and mingled even more so than, you know, Judah, which was also the same way. He went in Galilee, where is, which is referred to as of the Gentiles. One of the interesting things that you can see about Jesus, Jesus is the epitome of God choosing someone to use. He is the chosen one to be used for the greatest work. Obviously, he's God in the flesh, but he sent his spirit to conceive and to cause this man to come about that God himself would use. And two interesting things is, number one, as I pointed out last week in Matthew chapter number one, is when we look at Jesus' gene genealogy. There's very, there's, there's unexpected people in Jesus' genealogy. Number one, you have a Moabite. Number two, you have Rahab the harlot, a prostitute. You have, uh, you have you know, uh, um, the child that was conceived through Bathsheba with David, whom that relationship came about from an adulterous you know, uh, uh, all, you know, uh, interaction and murder. You know, so it's, you see these people, and then you have Tamar, which was also pretending to be a harlot. And you look at this, you look at, you know, the line of Jesus and where he came from, and it's like, wow, I wouldn't expect that. A lot of people be like, man, I wouldn't have expected that at all. But it just shows that God can use you no matter where you come from. God can use you no matter who your family is, no matter whether you're red, white, black, yellow. That is irrelevant to God. God can use you to do great things for him. You look at what Jesus did and how God chose Jesus and used him. And he didn't come from just this perfect, pristine. You don't have to be an independent Baptist. You don't have to have been saved since you were five years old. You don't have to have had parents that were saved and Christians and Baptists. God can use you no matter what. You don't have to have this perfect backstory to your life to be, able to, to be able to be used for God to do great things. And many times when you see people that do great things for God, they come from a, what we would be considered a questionable background. 
And they, and they end up in their life, uh, you know, maybe building huge churches, maybe serving in, in a ministry, you know, being a missionary and just reaching millions or thousands with the gospel. Hundreds of thousands of people. You don't have to have this, this perfect life before you get saved. God can still use you and God wants to use you. And furthermore, not only do you have to not have this perfect backstory of where you're from and everything, you can serve God anywhere. He took Jesus and he didn't take him to Jerusalem. He took Jesus and he put Jesus, a sinless man, in the land of what's called the land of the Gentiles. And, and what type of life did Jesus live? A sinless life. You can serve God anywhere. You can, it doesn't matter where you are. You can serve. Obviously, we should put ourselves in the situation where we're able to serve God the best that we can. But you can serve God anywhere. You can do great things for God anywhere where you're at. You can, you can, you can, you know, you know, uh, 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 thrive in your Christianity. You can grow in your Christianity. And oftentimes, people love to use excuses. People love to use excuses, and they all, and even to themselves, they justify like I would do more if I was here, or I would do more if I was there, or I would, you know, that person has this better opportunity than I do. You have no excuse. You know what you need to do is you need to. You need to, where you're at and with what you have, you need to serve God to the best of your ability. And wherever you are and whatever you have, in the situation right now, God wants to use you to do great things for Him. Just like He used Jesus. Just like He used Jesus, and Jesus was able to do great things in the land of the Gentiles. Let's bow our heads and have the word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you, dear Lord, for uh, Matthew chapter number 2, the great things that we can learn from it, dear Lord. We ask you that you'd be with us the rest of the night and uh, that you would continue to bless our church. We're so thankful for our church and the people that are here, dear Lord, and those that serve. Uh, uh, just, just strengthen us with unity, dear Lord. Help us to be humble before the King of the Jews and to worship Him and to understand His royalty and to honor Him and revere Him as He deserves and as the wise men uh, so, so uh, richly bestowed upon Him. We ask You, dear Lord, that You would uh, help our church to be centered around Him just in that type of picture where, where we are Christ-centric church. We love You so much and just be with the rest of the night and bless all the families that were here. In Jesus Christ's name, Amen.